Hi, this is a short documentary film about the life of Aristotle, the famous ancient Greek philosopher. I'm Edith Hall, I'm Professor of Classics at King's College London. And in the course of the film, we go to all the places where Aristotle ever lived, there are eight of them in the ancient Greek world, to find out how his material environment stimulated his philosophical thought. We're in Polykyros, which is a small town in eastern Kiviki. It's very close to Stagora, where Aristotle was actually born. And the reason we come here is that the Archaeological Museum in Polykyros is where some of the finds from Stagora, some of the actual artefacts that Aristotle would have uh, grown up and seen and looked at as a young boy, bits of temples, are in this museum. Very sadly, as quite often happens in Greece, um, although there was nothing on the website, the Archaeological Museum will be closed throughout 2016. We're told this is uh, for renovations, but actually what's happening quite a lot in Greece because of the economic crisis is that museums are being closed rather indefinitely, which is incredibly sad. But nothing uh, frustrated, we're actually just going to go on to Stagora and see where he was actually born and see what we can find there. On the top of the mountain, high up a winding road, very close to where Aristotle was born, the local people have actually established a park in his honour, it's the Aristotle Park, and one of the things they've done is written some of his most famous quotations about science and nature and philosophy on stones as you walk round, so that the whole place feels as though you've got Aristotle here uh, thinking about his surroundings, wondering about the elements, wondering about all the wildlife, as a small child up in these mountains. So this is actually meant to honour the fact that it was his upbringing here that enabled to become him to become the great philosopher and scientist that he did. So I finally made it to the actual statue of Aristotle, which was built and set up in 1954 in the Aristotle Park near Stagira. Uh, the people of uh, Kalkiviki, the local area, did this entirely at their own expense because they wanted to celebrate their most uh, famous um, um, Stagirite. And they've actually written it here, Aristotelis or Stagiavitis, which means Aristotle, the man from Stagira. And the Greeks come here for their picnics, they bring their children, it's high in the mountains. You can hear the amazing bird song. You can see all the incredible uh, different trees and, and different wildlife up here in the hills. And they've given him just one papyrus roll here. They haven't named it. We don't know which one it is. So you can use your imagination as to whether that is actually uh, one of his books on ethics or one of his books on biology or on cosmology, on the stars, the heavens or on the natural world. So for me, it's a very, very very great day that I finally arrived at Stagira to meet the philosopher himself. So we've arrived at Stagira, the ancient town where Aristotle was actually born 2,400 years ago. I've been planning to come here for most of my life. It's absolutely thrilling. What I was unprepared for is the sheer height of this promontory where Stagira was built. Extraordinary. On one direction it's the mountains, but down here this was Aristotle's everyday view in his childhood. And this is the author who came to write on the nature of the heavens, he came to write on the nature of sea power. There is nothing in the natural world he didn't write about. And this was what he was thinking about, I think, when he was a little boy growing up with these extraordinary views in the ancient town. This wonderful building is actually the civic heart of ancient Stagora. It's the beating pulse of the community. It's where the menfolk, like Aristotle's father Nicomachus, would have met for counsel and to discuss matters of policy. Um, on other days it would have had different kinds of commercial activity going on in it. It was the public city centre. But it wasn't a square quite as we imagine a lot of ancient uh, Greek cities. This was actually roofed building, it had, had some sort of roof so that they could even meet in bad weather. And we've got here actually the bases of all the pillars. They were made of wood 
and they were just attached on top of this marble base. So you have to imagine a pillared colonnade that you'd walk up and down in and meet even in bad weather, even in the rain. In Aristotle's day, this would have been packed with the important local leaders and the important local businessmen and politicians and all the important decisions about what they would do, whether to go to war, how they would answer Philip of Macedon's requests, would be made here. Ancient Stagger was a very well-built town. The houses were built into the steep slopes. We're very fortunate that a few actual classical era houses have survived as a kind that Aristotle's own family would have lived in. And this is one of them. It's a substantial two-storey house. This particular room was the one for men, the Andro. This is where Aristotle's father, Lycomachus, would have invited other important male guests. It may even have been his practitioner's room as a doctor, it may have been here, this kind of downstairs room, that Aristotle's father did his actual medical practice. Aristotle, if this were his house, would have been born upstairs in the women's quarters, the Gunai Kaon. Women tend to have a whole floor of the house to themselves, um, but we can be sure, because his father was a doctor, that if there was any kind of obstetric problem, he could have gone upstairs to help. But the amazing thing for a family house is the view. Little children growing up in Stagna like Aristotle would have been able, when the first time they ever looked out of a window, this is what they would have seen. Most of the religious buildings of Stagora seem to be built on this slope, which really goes all the way down to the sea. This is so the gods, the sea gods, are absolutely present here. I'm actually sitting in circular Thesmophorion, which was the temple of Demeter and Persephone, the goddesses who looked after arable farming and making sure that everybody had enough bread to eat. But that was mainly a cult that women worshipped. So Aristotle's mother Festus would certainly have come to this temple at some point or other. There are other sanctuaries and other temples up the hill. The point that is really interesting to me though, this was built in the reign of Philip II. And we know that Philip II actually conquered Stagora and had the entire city raised to the ground and all its inhabitants arrested. This was long after Aristotle was living here. And the story goes that Aristotle was so upset because he loved his native town so much that he pleaded with Philip to rebuild it and restore it to its former glory. And he did. And this may be one of the temples that he actually added at that time with the rebuilding plan to say sorry to Aristotle. Here, right down at the water's edge, as if they actually used the seawater in some of the rituals, is a very ancient temple, an archaic temple of a goddess, but we don't know which one. We know it was a goddess because of the female statues and decorations found here. What's really interesting to me is that in one of his works, Aristotle says that pregnant women should take a walk, it's healthy for them to walk every day to the shrine of one of the childbirth goddesses. And they included Artemis and what are called Anus Weir, also Hera. I think it may have well been Temple of Artemis here, and I like to think that Aristotle's mother Festus came here when she was pregnant to pray for a safe delivery. I've just finished going round the archaeological remains of ancient Stagora, and I must say what's really come through to me is what a tight knit and um, intimate sort of community it must have been. We've got small domestic houses with very tight relationships in the family. We've got temples for the um, women to go to as well as the men. And we've got what must have been for a lot of um, history, a small independent city state of independent men who are not subject to any other master or king or lord. And that's what's really interesting about the history of Stagora. When Aristotle was born, Stagora was struggling to stay independent of the might of Macedon, but in fact it did fall in the end. And that is one of the tragedies that's actually, I think, implicit in his politics, his political theory. There's a tension between his ideal community, which is always assumed to be an independent city-state, and the idea of great monarchies. So I'm standing in the main square of Pella, 
the great city that the Macedonian kings had built for themselves in this alluvial plain, this flat, flat, fertile area that went down to the sea, which was lapping at the very foot of the city in Aristotle's day. And it's just the sheer scale of the place that is really, really, really difficult for, to imagine how a small boy will have felt when he came from that rocky little town of Stagira. It's got dozens of buildings, dozens of houses. It had an incredibly sophisticated central heating system, incredibly sophisticated water supply, shops, beautiful temples, Doric porticos, and it goes on for several square kilometres. So here we're talking about an urban centre of a kind and a scale that was really almost unheard of anywhere in mainland Greece except for the old cities like Athens and so on. And the point about the Macedonian monarchy for Aristotle is even though he may never have lived here in this particular city for more than a few weeks at a time, because he may have taught Alexander out at Mieza, and when he was a small boy he presumably shuttled between here and Stagira, this dominated his life. Everything that went on in the palace, the royal family, whether it was King Amintas, his son King Philip, or his son King Alexander, everything affected every stage of Aristotle's life. I'm here in the Archaeological Museum at Pella, which was the ancient site where the Macedonian kings built their enormous palace around the end of the 5th century BC. And this is where Aristotle would have come as a very small boy with his father, Nicomachus, when he came to pay his medical visits on King Amintas. But just to give you an idea of the kind of wealth we are talking about, this extraordinary gold wreath chaplet with its carved leaves, little buds, um, it's got a little pine cone, delicately constructed in gold, the most glittering, wonderful gold from the Macedonian gold mines was actually found in a grave. They had so much money they could afford to leave this kind of thing as grave goods. Now what interests me is how a little boy from Stagger, a very nice town, but hardly one with displays of ex exhibitions of wealth like this, how it would have seemed to him to come to Pella as a child. And also, his philosophy as he grew up was very much about moderation. Um, he wrote a great deal about how men of authority, power and wealth should tread a middle path in how far they displayed it between extravagance and pomp on the one hand and looking shabby and mean on the other. This is the site of Plato's Academy, the first great university in Athens. And it was here when Aristotle was just 17 years old, a very precocious, intellectual young man from northern Greece, that he came first as a student. It's the most beautiful site just west of Athens. It was famous for things like its nightingales. It's still got beautiful woods. The remains here actually aren't from the period when Aristotle studied here because this remained for several hundred years in antiquity after Plato had famous university. So there's different buildings from all sorts of periods, including the Roman period. But the important thing is Aristotle loved it so much here and became so quickly devoted to Plato's teaching as he stayed for 20 years. This is part of the archaeological dig at Plato's Academy where Aristotle spent 20 years of his life, the prime of his life, from 17 to 37 years of age, studying with the greatest philosopher in Greece. But quite soon, Aristotle started to uh, challenge his master. He had a very different approach to the universe. He was much more interested in natural science. And we know that he read voraciously. He was even known as the reader in the academy. His other nickname was just the noose, the mouse, the mind. Plato apparently used to say, it's really quiet here, if Aristotle took a day off or wasn't there for a while. We even know a detail that in 357 BC he watched a particular celestial happening when the moon passed in front of the planet Mars, Aries as they called it nature Greece, from somewhere here. So you have this extraordinary young man looking around him everywhere, studying everything, absorbing everything, reading every ancient philosopher before him, every natural scientist before him. And it was only after 20 years when Plato died finally decided to leave. I've arrived in Assos on the northwest coast of Turkey. This is where Aristotle came at the biggest rupture in his life for 20 years. 
when in 348 BC he had to leave Athens. Plato died and he had nowhere to go because he wasn't made head of the academy. Eusippos, who was a lesser philosopher but Plato's relative, was made head of the academy instead. Aristotle was invited by a fellow student from Athens called Hermias, who was the ruler of a small independent kingdom here on the west coast of Turkey, directly opposite the beautiful island of Lesbos that you can see in the background. And we think that Hermias actually invited several philosophers. He had an independent kingdom struggling to keep separate from either the rising Macedonian Empire in northern Greece or Persia, which is the massive empire in the hinterland of this beautiful coast. We think he may have invited a circle of philosophers to help him frame the laws and set up a country that would be an ideal place to pursue happiness in, which is, of course, what Aristotle said was the goal of all individuals and of all communities. Aristotle in some ways would have felt completely at home here. What really hits me is that it's a high, rocky, quite small city, very like his hometown of Stagra up in northern Greece. The other is that on the top of this high, rocky citadel is no less than an archaic temple of Athena. This would have been so like the Parthenon for him in Athens, which of course went up in the 5th century BC under Pericles. And he'll have been looking at for 20 years in Athens. When he comes to Assos, he gets to see this beautiful Doric temple of the city goddess Athena, which is smaller but not at all dissimilar from the one on the Acropolis in Athens. And I'm going to look at it now. This is amazing. This is a 6th century archaic Doric style temple of Athena with several pillars still standing and the absolutely clear step upwards. The archaeology of the whole thing is almost intact. It hasn't been beaten to bits by tourists because there's nobody here. This is on an ordinary sunny weekday. We're the only tourists here. We saw one school party probably arriving up the hill from the old town. It's incredible to me and it makes me feel very happy because I know that Aristotle will have certainly not only looked at this temple every day for two years, but he almost certainly at least have attended ceremonies and festivals here. Aristotle didn't believe that the gods involved themselves in everyday humans' lives and he thought we should do moral philosophy and figure out how to be good people without involving the gods in that thinking. But he did feel that the practice of religion was essential in terms of rituals that brought together citizens. He approved of a city having regular, well-ordered religious services and activities. Well, here we have the strangest site. We're just outside Old Assos and the village that leads up that hill to it. And there's a cliff here where a very large statue of Aristotle once stood. I've got photographs of it, I've seen it. Um, his name was never written fully out of Aristotle, just Aristotle. But nobody around here seems to think very much about Aristotle. There aren't even bridge magnets in the shop of the actual site available for Aristotle. There's one or two different Greek gods and the Trojan horse, but that's it. And I'm beginning to wonder whether it is a part of the Turks' collective amnesia about the classical philosophy which went on in their country long before Islam began. We found the old theatre of this wonderful town of Assos. It's right down by the sea, just as the ancient Greeks always like to build it. It's really very well preserved, but they're renovating it because they have started to perform here in the summer. Apparently Greek companies come here and do perform ancient Greek plays. It's very well preserved. It's from the third century BC, which means that it was actually constructed after Aristotle was here. But it may well have been his interest in culture and theatre, which we know he developed at Athens, that developed a local culture of it and will have encouraged the building of it when the whole theatre industry took off over the entire world that Alexander had conquered. The theme of Greek tragedy here though really gets to me because only two years after Aristotle <coughs> arrived here the whole of this wonderful little kingdom came under intense pressure from the Persian Empire. Aristotle fled to Lesbos and Hermias, his friend, was actually arrested and tortured to death by the Persian royal house and the whole thing collapsed and it fell to Persia and it feels very suitable theme for a theatre in which so many Greek tragedies were actually played out. In the 
mid 340s BC, Aristotle, when he was about 38 or 39, came over the sea from what's now Turkey, Assos, to the island of Lesbos. And he lived here for more than two years. And he almost certainly brought with him his young wife, Pythias, who he'd married in Assos. And she had a baby daughter here called Pythias as well. I've come to the Archaeological Museum in Mytilene, which is the main port city where he probably arrived from Turkey, to have a look at the kinds of sites and objects and artifacts and everyday things he would have made use of while he was living in Lesbos. In the Archaeological Museum in Mytilene, there are many, many objects which show how incredibly excited the local people were by the wildlife and plant life on this extraordinary island. And that's what was going to be so important to Aristotle on this island. His researches were going to be into the marine life and the fishes and the animals that lived around a very famous lake called Kaloni. We're going there later. This mosaic is from much later than Aristotle. It's from the Roman period, but it shows two men in a boat looking at all the different kinds of marine life. And it could easily be a picture of Aristotle and his friend actually going out on a scientific expedition. I'm here in beautiful Erythos on the southwest side of the island of Lesbos. This is where Aristotle's best friend came from. He was actually born here or in the village just up the road, which is another part of Erythos, the twin village. He was named Theophrastus and he was a man of uh, Erythos. Now, all of Aristotle's philosophy, moral philosophy, was based on this single relationship between friends. He believes that friendship, committed partnership with humans, is what separates human beings from animals. It's what enables them to make communities beyond the family, and then in villages, in towns, and then in the city state. And his own best friend, he was friends for his entire life from the time he was a student in Athens. When whatever happened in Athens at the end of his time at Vegas and Harry came around, there was an invitation waiting in Lesbos from Theophrastus. They were both great philosophers and great scientists, and in the end, Aristotle actually left the Lyceum at Athens in the control of his best friend, Theophrastus. It's a delight for me to come here and have a meal with my friends by the sea. And just the other side of the square in Erisos from Theophrastus is this statue of Sappho. Now Sappho lived far too early for Aristotle ever to have met her, but some people said she did live in Erisos. She was the other famous native of Erisos, like Theophrastus. What really amuses me is that she was known to have been a very short woman in antiquity. She was a little woman. And of course this statue which has been here for 10 years is, is, is anything but the statue of a short woman. But the important thing here is that Lesbos, from far back in antiquity, had been a land of intellectuals and poets. She's not the only famous poet from Lesbos. There was also two men, one called Arion from Methina and Alcaios. Lesbos, a thousand years before Aristotle visited here, was known for its high culture, its great poets and its incredibly high level of civilization. So he will have come here and, and found it very sophisticated and probably somewhere that was very refreshing for him after he felt, I think, rather rebuffed from Athens. We've come up into the mountain part of Erisos. It's just a couple of kilometres up from the sea, but it's actually got to the effect of a tiny mountain village. And what's wonderful for me is that the gymnasium here, just the state secondary school, this neoclassical building is called the Theophrastion, the school of Theophrastus. They're still so proud of their ancient ancestor. And of course, Theophrastus was a philosopher like Aristotle, but he was also a great scientist. He was a botanist. His most famous work was actually a work of moral philosophy called The Characters, where he describes different kinds of people that you meet. The a difficult man, the flatterer, the bad-tempered man, and so on. And I've actually seen quite a lot of faces around in this village that make me think that he knew exactly what he was talking about. 
I'm sitting in a restaurant by Lake Kaloni in the middle of Levsos. This used to be called Pira in Aristotle's day. And what's so important for Aristotelian studies about this place is that in this lagoon, we know he studied a lot of marine life and fish and different kinds of creature and the birds flying over it. In his two great treatises on animals, he mentions this place more often than any other. And he also describes how he dissected different fish and creatures that he found in there, including the soupia, which is a, a cuttlefish. And I'm lucky enough to, that I'm going to be able to um, eat one of those, cook this right here on the seafront on Lake Kaloni. Now, of course, Aristotle's zoology really founded biological studies for the world. It was the first systematic, classified description of all animal life as he had seen it and described it empirically. We owe Western and, in fact, world zoology, as we understand it, to Aristotle sitting here looking at the fish in Lake Kaloni. I'm right here by Lake Kaloni, which Aristotle knew as Lake Pira, which is an extraordinary inland lagoon, but with access to the sea in the middle of Lesbos. And because he spent at least two years on Lesbos, researching the wildlife, especially the sea creatures and marine creatures that he found here, the people of this wonderful island have actually put up a statue to him in 2014, Aristoteles, which is Gates. And it actually says, here in the Gulf of Kaloni, from 345 to 342, the great philosopher uh, carried out his biological studies. This is where he did it, stunning background. And I really feel I can't cope for it like to make part of our scientific work. I'm actually sitting on a pillar of the colonnade of Aristotle's own university in Macedonia. He was invited here in 345 BC by Philip of Macedon to educate Alexander, the future Alexander the Great, and the other young men of the court. But he was not, in, uh, Philip didn't insist that he taught him at the actual court at Pella, which of course was full of all sorts of other things going on, imperial business, he was inviting admirals from Crete to come and advise him on how to build a navy to conquer the world. He was inviting engineers to build his war machines from Sicily. So a philosopher needs somewhere rather quieter. And in this idyllic spot, a few kilometres from Pella, it's called Nieza, and it's where there's the shrine of the nymphs, a perfect natural source of water, up in the hills with the most beautiful walks for the walking philosopher to go on. You have to imagine Aristotle actually sitting here teaching the young Alexander, we're told, not just the great political theories and the great philosophical theories, but all kinds of really recondite and mysterious information that was only going to be shared with the ruling class. The ancient Greeks liked to build their schools and universities near to ancient shrines, whether the muses or the nymphs. And this particular one is sacred to the nymphs of the water. And you can still hear it from the natural spring trickling down behind me. It's been very carefully designed, this school. It was built at exactly the time that Alexander was a, a young man, young boy, being taught by Aristotle and in the middle of the 4th century BC. And it was actually carefully designed, built in between two natural caves with a big stoa. Imagine all the pillars in here. And the caves are presumably used to help keep things cool, good storage, but the place is put so that the sun comes in at different angles, different times of the day, allowing the philosophers to look at this staggering view across this valley full of, at this time of year in March, different coloured blossoms of every kind, and being able to elevate their minds onto the higher matters of philosophy. The school of philosophy that Aristotle founded is called the Peripatetic School. Now that sounds quite complicated, but what it actually just means is the school of walking people. The word peripatima in modern Greek still means a stroll, you go for a stroll. Peripatain meant to take a stroll. Uh, Aristotle thought absolutely that the body and the mind worked in perfect harmony and he liked the rhythm of walking as he thought and discussed. He would take all his disciples, including Alexander, for walks while they talked. 
what I can really see here at Mieza, where you've got these extraordinary woodlands carpeted at this time of year anyway with daisies and bluebells, that this is where maybe he first got into the habit of those long walks while he thought about philosophy. We're finally near the end of our journey. This is Aristotle's Lyceum. This is the place that he had wanted to open all his life. In 335 BC, he finally got the opportunity to open his own university in Athens. When Alexander went off to Asia, he was free at last to devote his life to intellectual pursuits. And it's only quite recently that this whole wonderful site of his Lyceum, where he used to walk and talk with his fellow philosophers and his students around this open uh, cloisters here, while um, young men would also exercise in the gymnasium in the middle. It's only in the 1990s that this was actually discovered. And it's incredibly exciting that we can actually stand here where Aristotle himself would have had conversations with his disciples. The Lyceum is called the Lyceum because it was built in an ancient sanctuary of the god Apollo in his wolf form. So that's what Lycaon means in Greek. But what it really was, was the first ever great university research centre and library in world history. At this Lyceum, Aristotle collected an enormous number of books, so some say he kept them at his own personal, in his own personal residence, wherever that was. And he had a huge number of students working on all kinds of projects, like doctoral students today. And in fact, so famous was his library and his way of organising it, that when the great kings of Alexandria built their world-famous library, it was Aristotle's model that they borrowed. When Aristotle came and opened the Lyceum in 335, he was about to start on 12 golden years. We think he wrote nearly all of his, his books, there's 150 books in that time. Although unfortunately, most of the really accessible ones that would have been easiest for us to read is public lectures that he used to give here in the afternoon to anyone who wanted to come, not just his students. Unfortunately, those have been lost. But after that 12 years, unfortunately, Alexander died over in Asia and Aristotle himself had to leave because anti-Macedonian feeling rose up. But he was able to leave the Lyceum in the capable hands of that old best friend from Lesbos, Theophrastus. He'd come with him to help him teach and I'm quite sure to help look after the wonderful gardens here which were kept green with this extraordinary water system and where they grew plants of all kinds I'm quite sure and I like to think that Theophrastus long before he became head of the Lyceum was supervising both the wild and the cultivated plants that still flourish here now. So now we've arrived at our final destination, which is Chalcis in Evia, the long island off the east of the Greek coast, not so very far from Athens, where Aristotle ended his days. In 323 BC, Alexander was killed or died under very mysterious circumstances all the way over in Asia. And Aristotle was drummed out of Athens because of his supposed Macedonian connections, possibly on a charge of impiety like Socrates had faced all those decades ago. He came to Chalcis, which was where his mother had originally come from, and he spent about a year here before his death. On the esplanade at Chalcis is our last statue of Aristotle. This was actually put up outside the Demarchion, on the town hall by the citizens of Chalcis. And very touchingly, it actually um, names his mother Festus on the plinth because she was the person in his family who originally came from there. Now, he probably died of stomach cancer. He'd suffered from stomach problems all his life, but no doubt the stress of feeling he'd had to go to self-exile from Athens made that a lot worse. But the early Christians said no. They said that he committed suicide by jumping into these very waters, the tides of Gendrinus, because he couldn't understand scientifically how they operated. The tides here are quite extraordinary, and the minute I go to talk to an expert, a, 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 a Greek admiral who knows all about how these tides operate, but the early Christians wanted to say that rational science was not enough to understand the universe, and Aristotle really should have believed that God and that God affected the world more than he did. 
So they invented the idea to commit a suicide here. And it is indeed incredibly dramatic, and you can see why this, the story took hold of the imagination. In order to find out more about the times at Europus, I invited along Rear Admiral Simeon Konstantinidis of the Hellenic Navy. He's also a qualified oceanographer and meteorologist. Simeon, could you explain to me exactly what is this strange natural phenomenon that happens here at Abrikos with the tides? Uh, this is a unique phenomenon that happens here in the channel of Abrikos. Uh, it's connected to the tides. So every six hours we have a reverse of the current flow. Is it's that what's happening now? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Now we have a strong current as we see. It goes from south to north. And this happened because when we have a high tide, uh, the, the waters are coming from the south. The level of the waters here is higher, so we have the flow from south to north. After six hours, this flow will change and we will have a stop of about 10 minutes and the flow will go from north to south. This happens continuously, uh, four times a day, 24 hours. So after his 63 eventful years on the planet, Aristotle finally died. He was buried either here in Chalcis or possibly his body was taken to Stagira to his original homeland. We simply don't know. What I do know is how much I enjoyed the Aristotle tour, how much it's enriched my understanding of where his ideas came from and how they evolved. And if you're interested in that, I've got a book coming out later this year on how Aristotle's philosophy can help you in your own life.